Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. My name is Richard Rothstein. I'm a research associate here at the Economic Policy Institute. Uh, the Economic Policy Institute, as you may know, is a research institute here in Washington whose research and policy analysis is primarily devoted, devoted to providing the basis for improving the living standards of the vast majority of working families, of, of Americans who are working families in this country. Uh, we do uh, some education work as well, and uh, for that reason we're, we're very honored and proud to um, have Diane Ravitch here with us today. Uh, I'm not going to take a lot of uh, time with these introductions because uh, I want to leave all the time for our distinguished panel. The panel, of course, uh, consists of Diane Ravitch, who is the author of many important books. Uh, I've had the opportunity to write about many of her books. And uh, the most recent one is called The Death and Life of the Great American School System. Uh, she will talk about that book and be available to sign, to sign copies uh, outside the room at the conclusion of the program. Uh, you may be interested in uh, knowing that this book has only been out for 10 days and is already in its third printing. It is uh, hard to uh, avoid the glowing reviews in places like the Los Angeles Times and the Washington Post, uh, uh, the Atlantic Monthly, uh, and uh, I'm sure that um, Diane's talk will be provocative and justify the overwhelming response that the book has had. Responding to her and commenting on her presentation and on the book are first uh, Carmel Martin to my left. Carmel is the Assistant Secretary for Policy Development at the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, you may know that she uh, just over the weekend, the Department of Education released its blueprint for the reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. Uh, Carmel was primarily responsible for that blueprint. So the exchange between uh, Diane Ravitch and Carmel Martin will be particularly interesting today. The next uh, discussant is Bill Galston, uh, to Carmel's left. Uh, Bill is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution here in Washington. Uh, during the Clinton administration, he was a domestic policy advisor in the White House who was responsible for education policy during that period. So his uh, thoughts will also be important in the, the dialogue that follows. Uh, we're expecting uh, Randy Weingarten, the president of the American Federation of Teachers, also to be here and comment. But uh, if, if she's not here, uh, we'll have the opportunity to hear even more from Diane and Carmel and Bill, which will be a pleasure. So with that, I'm not going to take any more time. Uh, I want to turn it over to Diane to summarize uh, the argument of her, in her book and lead off the discussion. Thank you so much, Richard. I'm really pleased to be here today. And I have to say that uh, a lot of the credit for my book in some uh, sort of tracing history way goes to Richard Rothstein. Uh, back in the days when I was uh, uh, very uh, engaged in supporting the things that I'm now criticizing, Richard used to sit patiently with me. And he would take me to breakfast and take me to lunch. And we would argue and we'd walk around the neighborhood and we would argue. And I think that over time, I started listening to him. Uh, I'm, I'm honored to uh, have such distinguished commentators, uh, Cormel Martin, who's had such a major role in the redesign of ESEA. I was recently asked by a teacher blogger, if there is one thing you can do to improve No Child Left Behind, what would it be? And I said, remove the sanctions. And they seem to have done a large, um, gone a large measure in that direction. Uh, so I'm thrilled to have you here today, Cormel. And Bill Goltz and I have known for a very long time since the, his days of glory in the Clinton administration, and it's a great honor to have him here as a con commentator. Um, the, the main message uh, that I wanted to get out through this book uh, is, uh, as a historian, as someone who's been studying the history of American schools since uh, the late 1960s, early 1970s, I think that public education today is in great peril. And uh, having paid close attention to the many decades in which there was a lot of criticism of public education, it's occurred to me that the critics of public education, if you were to go back to the early 20th century or the mid 20th century, they always had an idea of making public education stronger, having better teachers, 
uh, better curriculum, higher standards, but what they didn't say, let's get rid of public education. Let us privatize our public schools and the private sector will do a better job than the government. And there is a very strong constituency today that makes that argument precisely. I have been hearing it for years now, and I think this is a danger. And I think that the testing and accountability movement is feeding right into the frenzy to privatize public education. Well, I want to say a word about the uh, subtitle of the book, which is How Testing and Choice Are Undermining edu Education. In fact, I'm not against testing. I think that testing can be very useful. I think we all need the information that we get from testing. What I am opposed to, which I explain in great detail in the book, is the misuse of testing. I'm not opposed to accountability when accountability is used for diagnosis and information and for support to help teachers get better, to help schools improve. But I'm opposed to testing and accountability when it's used to punish teachers and principals and close schools. I'm not opposed to choice. I think everyone should have choices. But I'm against choice when it is used as a strategy to undermine, to privatize, and to destroy public education. Uh, just as an aside, uh, I should mention, this is something I've never mentioned anywhere, I had a hard time getting this book published. I've published 20 books, and my last book, The Language Police, sold very, very well, and I couldn't get a publisher for this book. I was turned down by 15 publishers, and they're all eating crow today. <laughs> <laughs> so I should mention uh, some of the discarded titles, because it's kind of fun. I had a hard time coming up with the right title. One title was Measure and Punish. And someone said, that suggests Foucault. And I said, that's a little obscure for the general public. <laughs> uh, and then another was No Silver Bullets. And that didn't go anywhere. And a third was Data Mania. Uh, and I could have called it uh, a, a title that's very popular on Amazon, Lies Our Policymakers Tell Us About School Reform. Well, there's been much ado in the coverage of the book about why I changed my mind. And I've seen uh, many emails cross my desk that say, well, you were one of the architects of No Child Left Behind, and you foisted this on us, and now you've changed your mind. Well, I'm happy to say that I was not an architect of No Child Left Behind. Sandy Cress and Margaret Spellings would be very surprised to hear this. Uh, I wasn't there. I, I, it was not the product of a right-wing cabal intent on destroying public education. Uh, it was, in fact, endorsed by nearly 90% of both parties. And uh, Richard reminded me on the train from uh, New York this morning that uh, it actually had more Democratic support than Republican support when it passed. So the Times said that I had done a U-turn, a 180, uh, and then Education Week said that I had recanted everything I had ever written. Um, neither of these things are true. And in fact, uh, the story that I tell in the book is that I went to a conference at the American Enterprise Institute in November of 2006, and I was supposed to summarize the day's proceedings. It was a series of papers about is, is No Child Left Behind working? Is the toolkit effective? And paper after paper of scholars of the presumably conservative bent said it's not working in California, it's not working in New Jersey, it's not working in Florida, it's not working here, it's not working there, kids are not making the choice, very few kids were choosing, uh, tutoring is not working, although it's enriching a huge test prep industry. And so at the end of the day, I summarized it by saying No Child Left Behind is failing, it's not working. So this overnight transition has taken me almost four years. Um, and in fact, when the NAEP scores came out in 2007, I wrote an article, an op-ed piece in the New York Times. Uh, the title was Get Congress Out of the Classroom, in which I said that No Child Left Behind had failed, that there, the gains were meager, uh, and that we really needed to rethink this whole approach. More importantly, though, I did not reverse ground on the values and principles that I hold dear. I rejected the means to achieving them. Testing and choice are means, they're not ends. And I argue that they have turned out to be ineffective means. Um, and as I say in the book, quoting John Maynard Keynes, although it may be apocryphal, I'm not sure, Keynes is supposed to have said, when the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do, sir? And it's very odd, this idea that comes across that you have one position, you stick to it for the rest of your life. If people never changed their mind in the face of new facts, it would be a very sad world, and all we would have would be the talking heads screaming at each other, which is where the direction we seem to be going in. Well, I always had one fundamental core principle, and I'd like to think that I've held to this, and that is that all children in our democratic society deserve a high-quality education that prepares them for post-secondary education, for work, and for citizenship. 
All children should be strengthened in mind, body, and character by their schooling, and all should have the chance to engage in the study of history, literature, geography, civics, the arts, science, foreign languages, and have time for physical education. This has been my core belief. It is, in my mind, the rationale for schooling. John Dewey wrote, and I agree with him, what the best and wisest parent wants for his child is what we should want for all the children of the community. Well, in my frustration with seeing these goals not achieved, I was on the lookout for strategies that might help towards that end, one of them being testing and accountability, the other charters and vouchers. And in my book, I argue that neither has brought us closer to the goals that I believe in. The passion for test-based accountability has, if anything, taken us farther away from the quality education that I endorse and prize. The strategy of market-based schooling threatens to undermine public education, especially in urban district, replacing it with schools that may or not be better and that may, in some cases, be even worse. Even worse, I think, than, than the chance we take as we move to market-based schooling is what it does to the public's attitude towards public responsibility for children. It creates the feeling that each of us is on our own and that there is no communal responsibility for the children that we are all, in fact, responsible for. So the privatization strategy ultimately destroys public education by creating the sense that I take care of me, you take care of you, we're all on our own. We're not in the same boat. We can each float on our, on our own. Defenders of accountability and choice argue that the curriculum has not narrowed. And to be sure, there is very little data about whether it has, at least for K through eight. But common sense suggests that if high stakes are attached only to test scores in reading and math, and no stake, stakes are attached to anything else, more time will be dedicated to reading and math, and less time will be available for anything else, even for recess. Well, in my enthusiasm for reform, I forgot the central lesson of my research as a historian, and that is be wary of reforms that claim to have produced miracles. Beware of miracle schools that cannot be replicated. Beware of silver bullets, magic potions, overnight solutions, do not trust in miracle schools and miracle districts. On closer examination, the miracle usually disappears. And so I concluded, looking across these past several years, that these strategies are wrong, I was wrong, and I have to correct the record. I have to correct the record because I can't go on just writing my blog and saying these things and not putting it together and having history record me as supporting things that I've come to think were wrong. The bottom line is that education is hard. It's not easy. It's an arduous process that requires willing students, engaged parents, supportive communities, adequate resources, and schools that have well-educated teachers and a coherent curriculum. Without a coherent curriculum, the goals of schooling are easily reduced to test scores alone. And as is generally well known, and as Richard Rothstein pointed out so well in his book, grading education, when any one measure is used, used to define a very complex activity, the measure itself becomes corrupted. I can get a graduation rate of 100% if you put me in charge of a school, but many of the graduates will be illiterate. That's what we're seeing more and more in districts that see a steady rise in their graduation rate, then their graduates go on to community college and cannot pass a placement exam in a two-year community college and need to be remediated but they will meet that goal. Give me a goal and I will meet it by distorting every other goal of the organization. The accountability strategy has warped US education to the pursuit of higher test scores, but not to better education. That's a very good note on which to welcome Randy Weingarten. Randy has now maintained her record of never ever having been on time. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we were gonna make history today, but we didn't. Many children today, especially in poor neighborhoods and in urban districts, are getting a schooling of test prep. But they're not learning anything else. They're, getting, they're learning how to take tests. And if you want to see a good example of this, I recommend you Linda Perlstein's very fine book called Tested, in which she describes a school in Annapolis where the children are getting higher scores, but they don't know anything about the community, the city, the state, the nation, or the world. That's not good education. 
In New York State, in 2006, when new tests were adopted in 2006, and these were the three through eight tests that were required by No Child Left Behind. So in 2006, the scores were scores uh, began to be recorded for three through eight, and by 2009, the scores had simply flown. They went way up, and the reason they went way up is because the cut scores were lowered. In 2006, a seventh grader taking the, the uh, math test, the state math test, needed to earn 59% of the available points on the test to be rated proficient. Now, there was a time when 59% was not considered a passing score, but to be proficient in 2006, the student needed to get 59.6% of the points. By 2009, a student needed to earn only 44% of the points to be rated proficient. By dropping the cut score from 59% to 44%, that produced a dramatic increase in the number of kids who were rated proficient. In 2006, 55% of the seventh graders were proficient, but by 2009, that proportion had flown up to 87%, creating the illusion of progress through the statistical game playing. States are now claiming that 80 to 90% of their students are proficient in reading and math because they're trying to meet No Child Left Behind's goal of 100% proficiency. But on the NAEP, the same states have only a third, very often fewer, of their students rated proficient. As Secretary Duncan often says, we're lying to the children, and he's right. We have created a system of institutionalized fraud in which we tell young people that they're doing very well, they're proficient, when they can't even pass the entrance exam. Not an entrance exam, it's just a placement test to get into a community college. Now, one of the questions that I looked at closely in terms of the research was the research on vouchers. We've had a half a century of advocacy for vouchers, and now there are 30,000 children in the United States using vouchers to attend public schools. We have seen no improvement of any significance in either Milwaukee or Cleveland, and we've seen small but significant gains in the District of Columbia, but only in reading. So when we look at the evaluations, the congressionally mandated evaluations for D.C., what we find is there have been no gains in math. There have been no gains at all for boys in reading or math. There have been no gains for the children who come from the schools in need of improvement, and no gains for those who enter with the lowest scores. Does anyone see a strategy for dramatic improvement of U.S. education in these results? I don't. You have to be a girl from a high performing, relatively high-performing school entering with relatively good scores, and you'll improve in reading but not in math. So it's very narrow, to say the least. When I looked at charters uh, and I looked across the landscape of research, uh, there are many different kinds of studies. We'll see more studies and evaluations. But the only major national evaluation was done by Margaret Raymond from Stanford. Her study was funded by the Walton Family Foundation and other charter-friendly foundations, so it was certainly not a hostile critique. What she found, looking at 70% of the charter school students in the U.S., in 15 states in D.C. was that 17% of the charters produce better results. 46% of the charters produce results that are no different from the matched public school. 37% per, uh, of the charters produce results that are worse than a demographically similar public school. This is not a good record. This suggests that as thousands of new charters are created, about if this pattern holds, 83% of them will be no better or worse than the existing public school that they replaced. When I looked at NAEP scores, I saw that charters and regular public schools had been compared starting in 2003. So they've now been compared in 03, 05, 07, and 09. And in all of these comparisons, the results have been the same. One sector or the other might have a small bump but fundamentally, there is no advantage to charters. There is no advantage for charter students, whether they are black or Hispanic or low income or in urban districts. Charters have not outperformed regular public schools. So when we say that we're going to have a dramatic expansion in the number of charters, we are not, we are not pursuing a strategy that has a successful basis behind it. Oh, thank you. What we also see, or what I found in my studies, was that where there have been evaluations of charters uh, that give them very strong uh, positive results, uh, like in Boston and New York, the charters are skimming uh, the best students. They are taking smaller proportions of English language learners, smaller proportions of special ed students, counseling out the lowest performing students, and some very successful charters like KIPP and YES Prep have very high attrition rates. 
So as they expand, the public schools get the public school, as charters expand, the public schools get ever higher proportions of the children who are hardest to educate. So I, could, I, I won't go in, because I don't have time, I won't go into the research about teacher value, uh, judging teachers by student test scores, but read chapter nine and you'll see that there is a, a, a very strong body of research that suggests that this is not uh, a worthwhile course to follow. The current craze to fire teachers, uh, I believe, is a red herring. Uh, if we fired every bad teacher in America, we would still have the same results that we get on international assessments because of the other things that are, that are lacking in our support for education, particularly not having a coherent curriculum. Last week's Newsweek cover annoyed me no end. They said it's, that bad teach, firing bad teachers is the key to saving American education. Well, of course we should fire bad teachers. I don't know anyone who says we should have bad teachers. And, and I think we should change any un union contracts that prevent f the firing of bad teachers after they've had a due process hearing. What Newsweek also implied is that we should get rid of unions altogether because the best schools, they think, are non-union schools where teachers work 50 to 60 hours a week and burn out quickly and turn over quickly. Newsweek also implies that we should get rid of public education altogether because it works so well in New Orleans, which cleared the way for dozens of non-union schools. Unions don't prevent high achievement. Massachusetts has the highest scoring schools in the country. They're all union. Finland has the highest scoring schools in the world, and they're all union. So I'm still waiting to hear from my friends on the right an example of a high-performing district or a high-performing state that has no unions or weak unions. No one has been able to give me anything other than an anecdote about a charter school that has a steady supply of graduates from Princeton, Yale, and Harvard who leave or burn out after two or three years. Some of my friends have said, what we need to do is blow up the system. Uh, well, I was never a radical. I wasn't a radical in the 60s. I'm not a radical now. I don't believe in blowing up schools and blowing up systems that have served us well. I don't believe the private sector or the market will serve us better. Look at the 2008 debacle in the markets. Do we really want to turn our children over to the same people who ran our markets into the ground? Does it irk me that some charter executives pay themselves half a million dollars a year to run schools for a thousand children? Yes, it does. And I predict that as time goes by, it will irk the public even more. In some ways, I'm still very much a conservative. I don't believe in blowing up the system. I don't believe that the federal government or Congress knows how to reform schools. I think there is a federal role basic federal role is to distribute money to the neediest students in the neediest districts, to level the playing field, to provide good research and good information, to enforce the civil rights of students and teachers, to ensure access to higher education to students who can't afford it, and most, not most importantly, but certainly to pay for what it mandates, which it still has not done in terms of special education. In other ways, I'm very much a liberal because I believe that we must preserve public space for public responsibility including public education. I respect teachers. I respect their right to bargain collectively for their salaries and working conditions. And I acknowledge that poverty is the single most important cause of low achievement. Anytime we alleviate poverty, we will improve the odds for educational achievement. And I'm libertarian because I want legislators to back off and stop trying to impose so-called reforms when they really don't understand the first thing about teaching and learning. As an educator, <laughs> as an educator, I would like to see more professionalism, not less. I would like to see more superintendents who've actually had hands-on experience in the, in the schools. I would like to see more principals who have been master teachers themselves, rather than someone who's taken a short time overnight leadership training program. I would like to see more teachers who have experience, rather than someone who went through a five or six weeks training program in the, su in the summertime. And so I end by asserting that we're on the wrong track, we need a vision of what good education is. We must demand a coherent curriculum for all children. And we should work together as citizens to strengthen public education and to improve schools in every community and in every neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diane. And now we'll hear, hear directly from Carmel Martin. Before is the Assistant Secretary for Policy Development at the U.S. Department of Education. Thank you, Richard. Whoops. Uh, thank you all for having me here. I want to thank Diane for her book and for her work, many, many decades of work on behalf of children and education, and thank Richard for inviting me to be here with you all today. 
I'm uh, pleased to be part of the discussion about the book and um, to share with you some of the President and the Secretary's plans for reauthorizing the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. As Richard mentioned, over the weekend we released our blueprint for reform, our uh, blueprint for the reauthorization process. I should have brought copies, but you can get them on ed.gov. Um, if you like it, then I'll take all the credit that Richard gave me for it, but if you don't, I'm afraid I'll have to share it with the Secretary and the President and my um, colleague, uh, the Assistant Secretary for Elementary and Secondary Education, Thelma Melendez. Um, I thought I would just spend a few minutes describing some of the content of our blueprint, which I think, much of which I think is responsive to some of the concerns that Diane raises in her book. <clears throat> there's clearly places where we'll have to agree to disagree, but I think there's a lot of um, a lot of places where there's um, the, both the president and the secretary share some of her concerns and have worked very hard to be responsive to them in this blueprint. And we look forward to working in a bipartisan way with Congress as we move forward to further develop the, the proposals that you see there. I would say, <clears throat> first of all, from an Overarching premise, there's three things we're trying to accomplish. There's many, many things we're trying to accomplish with this blueprint. It's it's long, the law is, is large, there's many, many programs implicated. So I, I don't have enough time to go through all of it, but I would say three of the most important things that we're trying to accomplish, accomplish is to ensure that the accountability system is based on a set of standards that are that are meaningful for children. As Diane, as, um, Diane mentioned, we would agree that uh, students need to know when they graduate from high school that they're ready for college and career and for life. So um, that is a big part of our blueprint. The second is to ensure that the system isn't all about sanctions um, or sticks, but also about incentives and rewards for excellence and success. And the third is that we um, do have a more humble uh, perspective on the federal role and allow for a larger degree of local control and flexi flexibility. But um, at the same time, maintaining a very, very, very uh, tight focus on closing achievement gaps and on the students who um, often get ignored in our system. Um, with respect to standards, um, before we started today, Diane was talking to me about how what's really important is help, and she mentioned it in her um, remarks, is not graduating from high school, but graduating from high school ready for success. So I would argue one of the biggest changes we're proposing um, and we use multiple levers to get there, is that the system really be founded on this concept that <clears throat> standards and assessments, curriculum, professional development, instructional materials should all be back mapped against the overarching goal of helping students to graduate college and career ready. We're also asking for a focus on what happens to children once they do graduate from high school, so asking for much more transparency around the number and percentages of schools from all subgroups that go on to college without the need for remediation and their success at the post-secondary level as well. With respect to standards, we're asking states, we're essentially following the lead of the nation's governors um, and strongly supporting their efforts to move towards a common core. Um, and believe they've done a, a ter terrific job in looking at what is necessary to be successful in both college and career. That said, these are not we are not proposing national standards. Um, we feel like it is important that we have that um, bottom-up approach as opposed to top-down approach. So that our proposal would create incentives for states to adopt the Common Core, but also acknowledges that if states choose not to do so, that there has to be an alternative. Our alternative is to ask states to work with folks within their own state, uh, the post-secondary system, the business community, the workforce community, to ensure that their own standards are aligned with this overarching goal of being college and career ready. Um, we'll ask them to demonstrate that students who graduate from their system and go on to college uh, do not need remediation once they enter college. So it's not that they can get into their pub four-year public university, but that once they get in and take entry-level reading and math classes, they don't need remediation. They're, they're ready for those courses. Um, the second big focus of our proposal, as I said earlier, is to do more to reward progress. 
um, under the current law it does a fairly good job of identifying failure and labeling schools and um, providing for sanctions but it doesn't do a very good job of rewarding progress and growth so one way we'll do that is by allowing for growth to count in the accountability system so student um, a fifth grade student who enters on a second grade reading level and gets to the fourth grade reading level by the end of the year not only is that a, a good a good amount of progress that's great progress that's not just a um, not a bad teacher that's a great teacher and a great school so we should acknowledge that kind of progress and give credit for it in the system with respect to accountability applied to schools and districts, we're also much more focused on progress over time and train, uh, trends compared to current law. And we think this will also help um, folks to find the accountability system is less um, of a one-size-fits-all approach. We're uh, looking for ways to in throughout the law to recognize and reward extraordinary um, performance so we proposed a rewards fund for high poverty high performing schools that do show extraordinary progress and it's not based on how many children are proficient but how many children did you get to proficiency given where they started likewise we're looking for ways to reward and recognize extraordinary performance of teachers the third big change we're looking to make is to move away from a one-size-fits-all approach to accountability. Most schools in our proposal will have flexibility for defining what interventions are needed in their schools and will be asked to look at a broad array of data, not just test scores, but other, other indicators of student and school success in order to determine what interventions are necessary. Um, <clears throat> one place where we will continue, though, to be less flexible is in the context of the lowest performing schools, our turnaround proposal. In that context, we're asking uh, states and districts to choose from four turnaround options. All of them encompass the idea of bringing in new talent into schools or providing intensive support for the, for the uh, personnel who are in the school right now. Um, <clears throat> we, we think looking at the research related to school turnaround that we need to give schools flexibility in those circumstances to get the best qualified and most mo motivated staff into the schools. We know that the current construct isn't working. Under current law, schools that are undergoing restructuring, 89 to 96 percent of them chose the other option. And between 2005 and 2007, only 19 percent of schools in restructuring made progress. So in that context, we will uh, be um, continue to be fairly aggressive and restrictive. But generally speaking, with most schools, our proposal um, allows for a lot greater level of um, state and local decision making in terms of what information to use to judge schools and what information to, uh, to use in determining what kind of intervention should happen. Um, keeping in mind that unlike the current system, we will have a system for acknowledging schools that are making progress. So the schools at the top end of the performance spectrum will be recognized and rewarded. The schools at the bottom will be asked to take aggressive action. The schools with the largest achievement gaps will also be asked to take action. We don't define what that is, but we ask schools, um, districts to put in place research-based interventions targeting those students who are causing the achievement gap. If after three years those interventions are unsuccessful, then we will um, have the state take over the control of how Title I funds are used in those schools. But for the vast majority of schools, we're recognizing that um, the, the analysis needs to be much more nuanced and there needs to be greater flexibility in defining what should be happening. Um, the fourth area that we believe our proposal uh, addresses and is something that Diane spends quite a bit of time in her book talking about is the phenomenon of narrowing the curriculum and teaching to the test. One way we're trying to get at this is by developing better assessments under Race to the Top, even before we get to the reauthorization, the Secretary has put forth $350 million to help build for to give out to states, so states working in collaboration under these common standards initiative can develop more sophisticated assessments that measure learning and not just test prep that are focused on things like performance tasks and not just filling in the bubble. 
We're also allowing states to use other subjects beyond reading and math in their accountability system, unlike current law. And, and asking schools to be tr transparent with respect to, but also use in determining interventions in schools other indicators, such as school climate, college going rates, and, um, and uh, attendance rates, other factors like that. We've also put forth a budget that has um, increased funding for broadening the curriculum and for providing student supports. Fifth area that I wanted to mention is that of shared responsibility. We've asked, unlike current law, we are um, proposing an accountability system that doesn't just leave all of the consequences for accountability at the feet of schools. We're also going to be asking states to identify chronically underperforming districts and high-performing districts and have a system of carrots and sticks consequences and rewards with respect to districts. And if there is a chronically underperforming district, we would ask that there be dramatic action just as we're doing in the context of schools, such as state takeover or the superintendent losing their job. Um, and we're also looking to have greater differentiation at the state level as well, and judging states in that new system based on their capacity to help schools get better. We're also doing more to build capacity um, build capacity by providing additional funding for school turnaround ever efforts, but also school improvement efforts. Under the current law, 20% of Title I funding it must be reserved for s supplemental services and choice. We're instead proposing that that funding be used to help build capacity at the district level to support school turnaround, support teachers, support schools. We're also looking at shared responsibility by um, providing funding to develop teachers parent and teacher surveys so we can ask teachers about their working conditions and ask parents about what they think about what's happening in schools and bring greater transparency on both fronts. We're asking states to tackle resource equity so they also take responsibility for the funding that's available at different schools and uh, providing funding for parent and community engagement activities. Last couple of areas that I'll mention is our efforts around teachers and leaders. Um, in that context, our, our focus is on the development of more sophisticated evaluation systems that so that teachers can get the information they need to improve teaching and learning. We, we do think that student ac academic outcomes should be part of those systems, but not only do we allow for other things to be included, but we require that other things be included as well. And we require that that information be used to help bring support for teachers so we can have professional development systems that are on-site, embedded, and, and being driven by the needs of the students and the teachers in those schools. We're also proposing that the information be used to identify the master teachers that Diane was talking about who can be con cultivated to be school leaders. We're providing additional funding for induction, professional development, the advancement systems like the one I mentioned, and also to create greater time for teachers to collaborate around information to improve instruction. Um, finally, I just mentioned that in terms of our um, Diane's comments about charter schools, I think the secretary has been very clear, and I hope our blueprint is clear, that although we are trying to pave the way for charters to be available where local communities think that's the best option for them, we're not requiring a certain number of charters or percentage of charters in any community, and we're putting a real focus on accountability. Quality matters. Uh, if you look at the research, some of the research that Diane mentioned, what you see is that the strongest, the best results we get in charters are where there are strong authorizing entities. So we're proposing changes in accountability for, for those um, authorizing processes. We're also supporting other school, innovative school models. I would say in, in the context of creaming, I think there, that may be happening in some instances. There was a recent study by Tom Kane that demonstrated that the KIPP schools in, in Massachusetts, they compared the students who, um, who were accepted and those who were not accepted. It was a lottery, so it was randomly um, assignment in terms of who got in and who didn't. What we see from his work is that the students who went got into the school did outperform the schools that didn't. They also didn't leave at higher rates than the students who uh, were not accepted. 
um, and there, the, the uh, incidence of students with disabilities and other special needs students were, were comparable to those in, um, in the regular public schools in those communities. So I, I say that not to, to say that creaming doesn't happen and shouldn't happen. It is something that we should tackle and make sure that there's equal access to charter schools um, and that they are not used as a, as an, um, a segregation tool. But I do think that there's good evidence that the best charter schools um, are doing a terrific job for um, many, many poor minority and special needs students. So it's an option that we would like to see available um, and, and although not requiring it, but at the same time pushing for greater sense of quality in that context and greater accountability, if not more accountability than the, the accountability system we're proposing for the regular public school system. Thank you. Thanks, Carmel. Um, we'll hear again from Carmel later. But now, Bill Galston, a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and during the Clinton administration, White House policy advisor covering education. Bill? Well, <clears throat> since Diane and I did this show five days ago at AEI, um, she can take a seven-minute rest here. Uh, not even the jokes have changed. Uh, <laughs> but it is, you know, it is indeed a, a pleasure to share this podium uh, with the Arthur Kestler of education reform. Uh, I'm told that one of the rejected titles for this book uh, was Darkness at Noon Recess. Uh, <laughs> uh, but all kidding aside, uh, I have the greatest respect for Diane's scholarship and personal integrity. And nonetheless, we disagree, I think. Uh, so let me tell you first what the disagreement is not about, and then segue to what I think it's about. Uh, it is not about her reading of the evidence on charter schools, number one. Number two, it is not about the negative consequences of an excessively narrow testing regime. Third, it is not about the impact of factors other than teaching on student outcomes. It seems to me that in the 30 years since the Coleman report, we have somehow segued from demographic determinism to pedagogical determinism, and it's not clear that there's been an analytical gain in the process. Fourth, our disagreement is not about the importance of high-quality national standards and curricula. And finally, it is certainly not about the vital importance of public education. So it's not about any of those things, what is our disagreement about? Here's my suggestion, and this is, I'm just testing this out, frankly. Uh, my suggestion is that it has something to do with our respective takes on the aggregate consequences of the series of strategies that we have pursued since, as a country since the publication of the landmark Nation at Risk report in 1983. It seems to me there are three basic positions on offer. There, there's probably a fourth, but I'm going to set that to one side. First, we've failed because we've been too moderate in pursuing assessment and choice, and so we have to intensify and radicalize our efforts. That's the position that Diane summarized tartly as blow the system up. It's associated with Checker Finn, among others. The second position is Diane's. Uh, uh, and... Uh, it is that we've failed because we're on the wrong track, uh, a phrase that she used in her concluding sentence today. So we should return to a more traditional conception of public education, what it is, what it's for, and how to make it better. There's a third position, which is mine, and that is that Nation at Risk set in motion a complex dynamic that is still unfolding in every area of public education, in standards, curricula, pedagogy, assessment, graduation requirements, among others. While progress has been slower than we had hoped, we're basically on the right track and should remain there while pruning away what hasn't worked. If you want a Clintonian formula, mend it, don't end it. Now, to provide some evidence for my judgment, I'd like to step back from current controversies and look at trends over the quarter century since Nation at Risk. And here I'm going to use the NAEP exam results as my principal focus. I have two reasons for this. First of all, it is a high-quality 
set of examinations, uh, a judgment that I believe both Richard Rothstein and Diane, Diane Ravitch uh, concur in. And second, and even more important, no one tests, no one teaches to it. So what Nate measures is not the artifact of drilling. It measures increments of genuine learning. So here's what we find. Uh, if you look at the 25-year period, overall reading and math scores are up significantly for both 9- and 13-year-olds, but not 17-year-olds. Suppose we zoom in a little closer and take as our baseline the early 1990s, when the standards and assessment reform effort moved from the states to the federal government during the administration in which Diane served. We see very much the same pattern. And moreover, we see when we break it down that gains are widely distributed across performance levels. Whether you look at the 90th percentile, the 50th, or 10th, you see significant NAEP gains. You see two other things that are worthy of note. You see much more robust progress in math than in reading, and I think there's an important story behind that. And secondly, we see that unfortunately the gains made in our elementary and middle schools are fading out at the high school level, and we certainly need to focus more of our attention there. We also see continuing reductions in the black-white achievement gap and smaller but still meaningful reductions for gaps between Hispanics and whites. Finally, let us take a look strictly at the NCLB period, which I'm defining as 2003 to 2009, where we have 2009 data. We see solid gains in both fourth grade and eighth grade math, and in fourth grade but not eighth grade reading. These results have been accomplished despite adverse demographic trends that are familiar to all of us. Among them, a flood of students whose pa parents' native tongue was a language other than English, uh, continuing family breakdown and rising out-of-wedlock birth rates, which are correlated with behavioral problems and lower academic performance, even after you hold everything else constant, and a troubling rise in child poverty. And finally, and uh, I'll be happy to lay this out during the question and answer period if anybody challenges it, during the NCLB period, Gains in hard-pressed urban school districts have been as robust as, and by some measures, more robust than in other areas. And I base that conclusion on the trial urban district assessment, which is a NAEP-based breakout of major urban school districts. I conclude, therefore, where I began. We're on, in the main, the right track. Over the next decade, we need to eliminate the flawed features of NCLB, but without throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And this means, among other things, broadening the assessment regime, reducing top-down compliance mechanisms, scaling back utopian goals, and continuing the push for better state standards and curricula. We need to use scarce public resources more efficiently, and we need to focus more on areas where we're falling short, such as high school attainment and dropout rates. In conclusion, I would say that Diane's book forces us to ask many hard questions, but in two respects, it's less useful than it might be. First, it doesn't distinguish clearly enough between the specifics of, of the NCLB to which she objects, and by the way, I object as well, on the one hand, and the broader education reform paradigm out of which it emerged. Secondly, it doesn't identify the effective agent to bring about her preferred alternative reform model. Consum consigning the future of public education to the forces that failed to deliver clearly necessary changes in the past doesn't strike me as a plausible formula for the reforms we still need. Thank you. I feel like I've been having the same con testing, testing. I've been having the same conversation, I would say, for the last 12 years, and certainly for the last um, 48 hours since the blueprint came out. Um, and I've had it on various different TV shows today, and I'll now have it here, <laughs> which is, are we on the right track or the wrong track? You listen to this panel. We've, you know, our 
desperately going in the wrong direction, which is why we need a complete and total overhaul of No Child Left Behind, versus when you look at some of the data, maybe there were some building blocks there that we should be building on. And maybe the United States education system is not as dire as people have said it is, particularly given all the things that have happened thus far. Um, should we throw out the whole thing, including the baby and the bathwater and everything else, or should we build on what works? And you can get all of that in the same panel, listening to the same um, panelists talking about various different pieces of the puzzle. What do I get from this? I get that what we do in public education is pretty complex. And we have to pretty much differentiate instruction for all the kids that we serve. Because kids are not the same. They're pretty different. And many of them, whether they come from affluent um, backgrounds or whether they come from impoverished backgrounds or whether they don't come from either, kids need lots and lots of different things these days. And one of the things that we have in the American education system, which is different in the main from the countries we most compete with right now, and these are my words, not anybody else's, is that we promise and have for generations universal access, and we promise but have not delivered universal attainment. And yet universal attainment has now changed hugely because we are now in a global economy. And so preparing kids for life, college, and career is quite different today than it was even 20, 30 years ago. So <coughs> the place where I and Diane fested up in her book and in the teasing that we both do to together, we've had this debate ourselves, I think, on and off privately and publicly for 20 years. Um, public education is not a niche market. I wish it could be, but it's not a niche market. And ultimately, whether or not charters cream or whether or not private schools cream or whether or not parochial schools did or whatever you say, the bottom line is that neighborhood school in a public education system has a moral obligation to take all kids within his or her grasp. There's no lottery with huge marketing, as I have seen in New York City, and frankly, even been privy to in the marketing we did in the two charter schools we created. For example, if you market strictly in English, you are making a decision about who you are marketing to in a neighborhood where you have multiple languages being spoken. That's a choice that one is making in terms of that. That's not a choice that a public education system has. We are not a niche market, probably the most important thing that I could say. And so therefore, when whoever comes within our grasp, we have to help. That is our moral obligation. So I have been in the search for the last 12 years, first as president of the UFT and now as president of the AFT. I am in search of what works. And I am in search of ensuring that we try and sustain and build capacity for what works without, and I'm going to say this clearly, without abandoning innovation. Because it's not simply taking something from somewhere else and trying to make it work in your situation, whatever that your situation is. It is trying to figure out what works educationally and then trying to sustain it and create capacity in all sorts of other places. And what have we seen over the course of time that works? And I've become a Johnny OneNote on this. And if you listen to Diane's epiphany, my words, not hers, you see this in the words that she has written. Well-prepared and supported teachers, good leaders, real 
robust curriculum so that teachers are not making it up every single day and so that kids, particularly poor kids, have access to art, music, physical education, and the civics that I and many others may be in this room thrive on. And significant resources to level the playing fields for poor kids. That's what Title I was about and is about. And one of the things that I am most concerned of, most concerned with in the blueprint, is the conversion of Title I to a competitive grant program. I don't think poor kids should have to have their resources dependent on whether or not a school district can afford to hire great grant writers. It should be based upon money going directly in a formula basis to poor kids. And last, and again I have been a Johnny One Note on this, what I have seen, and I fight the fights as hard as anybody else, confrontation and combativeness and competition are not the words that should be preferred or celebrated in public education. Collaboration, community, continuity, and capacity. Curriculum, collaboration, continuity, community, and capacity. Those are the C words that we should be focused on. I've never seen a school that has worked if there was competition or combativeness. I have only seen schools and districts work where people are on a shared mission, really shared mission, not rhetorically, but really, and where they work in collaboration together, adult with adult. That's not saying we don't do the tough stuff, like, as Diane said, focus like a laser on turning around low-performing schools, even closing them as the last resort, if that is the last resort. And the Central Falls situation showed us that last resort to one person is not last resort to another person. Making sure all of our teachers are well prepared and supported, and if they can't be, after we've tried and helped them, then we have to find ways, I would say humanely, but find ways to usher them out of the profession. So I'm not saying we don't do tough stuff, but once and for all, let's give the teachers the tools and the time that they need to do their jobs, like we see happen in Finland, like we see happen in Japan, like we see happen in places that we compete with. Let's be on a mission to find what works and zealots to make it work in other places, build that capacity based upon what works, instead of continuing to try to reinvent the wheel. Thank you.